Hello everybody, Academic Clinical Fellow Interviews, ACF Interviews are almost upon us and one of the first things that you're often asked to do is critically appraise an unseen paper or data set. It is the only truly unpredictable element of an ACF interview. You don't know the topic, you don't know the journal and therefore this is usually the bit that causes the most anxiety. In this video I'm going to give you a simple-ish formula for appraising any clinical paper in about 10 minutes, which is often all the time you'll have on interview day. And we'll walk through a real example together, the Aristotle trial, which compares apixaban and warfarin in the context of atrial fibrillation, for which there is a link in the video description below. It's a paper published in New England Journal of Medicine. You don't need a journal subscription to download the paper. A quick disclaimer before we start, none of what I'm about to show you in this video means anything without practice the way that I prepared and the way my wife prepared because we prepared together was to open random journals, pick random papers in random specialties and we challenged each other to do this and critically appraise under time pressure. And as we go, don't just listen passively to what I'm saying, pause the video, apply the framework yourself and then compare your answers to the things I say. So the framework we are going to use is big picture to start with, importance, methods, results, interpretation and applicability, and then bottom line. Not that many steps to remember. Let's start with the big picture. The first step with any critical appraisal task, whether that is a data set, a graph, or a paper, an abstract, is to orient yourself. We need to show that we understand what the study is about before we start criticizing it. I like to do three things personally. Identify the study type, summarize the PICO framework, and then state the clinical question in one sentence. So that starts with the study type. Is it a randomized controlled trial? Is it a cohort study, a case control study, cross-sectional study, systematic review? What is it? Just naming what it is shows the panel that you know where you are on the evidence hierarchy. Next is the PICO framework, population, intervention or exposure, comparator or control, and then outcomes. And then I try to put it all together as one clinical question, something like, in X population, does this intervention compared with this comparator affect whatever outcome you're interested in? So now let's take this all together and apply it to the Aristotle trial. Okay, thank you for this interesting paper to read. This is a large, randomized, double-blind trial. Thinking about the PICO framework, the population is 18,201 patients with atrial fibrillation and at least one additional risk factor for stroke. The intervention is a Pixaban, 5 milligrams twice per day, compared to warfarin, dose adjusted to keep the INR between 2.0 and 3.0. And the primary outcome is stroke or systemic embolism with bleeding and mortality as key secondary outcomes. And the clinical question for this paper is, in patients with atrial fibrillation and at least one stroke risk factor, does apixaban, when compared with warfarin, reduce stroke or systemic embolism within acceptable safety limits. That only took, what, 30 seconds or so? And just doing that first step, outlining the study type, the PICO and the clinical question, not only buys us a bit of time to think about what we're gonna say next, but it shows a degree of structure and it forces us to understand what the paper is about before we start pulling it apart in the next step. So now let's move on to importance and relevance. And the question is really, is this an important and sensible study to do with the limited resources that we have? I would ask myself three things. Is the condition common or serious? Is there genuine uncertainty, that is equipoise, about what we should be doing in this particular situation? And if this study were perfect, would the answer change practice or improve patient outcomes? In the context of the Aristotle trial, atrial fibrillation related stroke is common and highly morbid. Anyone that has worked as a doctor for any length of time knows this. Warfarin is effective, but it's awkward because it needs monitoring, it has food and drug interactions, and it carries an ongoing bleeding risk. So a safe fixed dose alternative that doesn't require INR monitoring and improves stroke prevention and or bleeding is clinically very relevant and potentially practice changing. And if you're not sure whether something is important or not, you could also ask yourself if the study were perfect and the methodology sound, who would care about the answer? Is it patients? Is it clinicians like you and me? Is it people writing international guidelines? Or is it just one small group of people sat in a room somewhere? Or is it no one? 
where does your abstract lie in the grand scale of consequences? Now that we've set the scene, let's move into the methods and internal validity. This is the core of our appraisal. What happened in this study? Can I trust the result? I then break this down into four mini steps, population and sampling, intervention and comparator, outcomes and follow-up, and then bias, confounding, randomization, and blinding. So firstly, population and sampling are little subset. Are the inclusion and exclusion criteria defined? How were participants identified and recruited? Are these patients representative of the population that I care about? And in comparative studies, are the groups similar at baseline in their key prognostic variables? Or to maybe sum all of these things up into one tighter phrase, I would look at how they defined and recruited the population. Are the inclusion and exclusion criteria clear? Are the patients in this study representative of the ones that I see? and are these groups comparable at baseline? For Aristotle, they include patients with atrial fibrillation and at least one additional risk factor for stroke. That is an appropriate, higher risk group, which is good for event rates and relevant when we're looking at whether people are having further strokes or bleeding events. But it may actually underrepresent the very low risk patients because they've specified that they need one additional risk factor. So I'd keep that in mind when thinking about how generalizable the findings are to my own practice. Next, the intervention or exposure and the comparator. Here, what you want to know is, is the intervention clearly described such as dose duration protocol? Is the comparator appropriate? Are we using a placebo? Is it standard of care? And if so, what is standard of care? Or is it an active control of some kind? Were those interventions delivered consistently? And were there any crossovers between the trial groups or protocol deviations? The key idea is if the intervention and the comparator aren't clearly defined and delivered consistently, then any differences that are found in the outcome might just represent poor implementation of the study rather than a true effect of the intervention. In Aristotle, the intervention here is a Pixaban 5mg twice daily, the comparator is dose-adjusted warfarin with a target INR of 2 to 3, which is appropriate as standard of care. On the face of the abstract, both are well-defined, and warfarin is a sensible comparator. That is the current standard of care, the gold standard treatment. Thirdly, we're then going to look at outcomes and follow-up. Is the primary outcome clearly specified and is it clinically meaningful or is it just a surrogate marker for something else? You may ask, how is it measured? Is it an objective or a subjective measure? Are the outcome assessors blinded in any way? Are validated scales used if it's a questionnaire? Is the follow-up period long enough to see a meaningful effect of what we're interested in? If you're investigating the effect of statins, for example, following patients up for six months is going to be next to useless when the risk factors are calculated in decades. And how much loss to follow-up is there, and is it balanced between the groups? You might say something like, I would ask whether the primary outcome is clinically meaningful rather than just a surrogate, whether it's clearly pre-specified and how it's measured. Then I would look at whether follow-up is long enough and whether loss to follow-up is small and similar in both groups. For Aristotle, the primary outcome is stroke or systemic embolism, which is a hard, clinically important endpoint. It's completely objective. You might want to ask how they did this, whether it was a clinical diagnosis or there was imaging confirming a stroke or embolism. The median follow-up is 1.8 years, which is reasonable in atrial fibrillation. The abstract doesn't give us full detail on loss to follow-up, but they do report event rates per year, which suggests that they have handled person time appropriately, at least from a certain surface read. And then finally, within the methods, we can think about bias, confounding, and randomization and blinding. At this point, it's also helpful to know the difference between a bias and a confounder. A bias is a systematic error in how a study is designed, conducted, or analyzed. It's a systemic problem with what you're doing. Whereas a confounder is a third variable that is associated with both the exposure and the outcome at the same time, and then distorts the relationship between them. In a randomized trial, we are especially interested in how the randomization was done, was it genuinely random? Was allocation concealed so investigators couldn't predict which treatment was coming next? And who was blinded? Was it patients, clinicians, assessors, all three? If you're instead looking at an observational study, the focus shifts to have they measured the key confounders and how have they adjusted for them? Have they done a regression, a propensity score? 
matching this kind of thing. Going back to Aristotle, it's described as randomized and double-blinded, which should greatly reduce selection bias and measurement bias. Randomization should balance both measured and unmeasured confounders between neopixaban and warfarin groups. One thing, however, is to note that it's industry-funded, so you need to keep sponsorship bias in the back of your head. That is not a reason to dismiss clinical studies, but it is reason, I think, to look at the methods and reporting with a little bit of extra care and scepticism. So in your Viva, you might say something like, randomization and blinding appear to be robust, major sources of bias are reasonably controlled for, but I would like more detail on X. And I think that means we can sound measured and thoughtful rather than either overly positive or overly cynical. Once you're happy with the methods, you can then move on to the results and statistics. So what did they actually find? And are the results statistically and clinically meaningful? Again, coming back to my checklist that I used, I had four things. What was the effect measure that they used? Was it a risk ratio, an odds ratio, hazard ratio, a mean difference? What is the size of the effect? Is it statistically? statistically significant. We can look at the p-value and the confidence intervals and see whether the intervals cross the line of no effect. And how precise is it? Are the confidence intervals very narrow or very wide? And for whatever statistics we've got, we need to check whether the study is likely to have been powered adequately for the primary outcome. And again, if that is not in the abstract or in the data set, you need to be mentioning that you would look in the full paper. So for Aristotle, for some headline numbers just from the abstract, for the primary outcome of stroke or embolism, the rate was 1.27% per year with Apixaban, 1.6% per year with Warfarin, the hazard ratio was 0.79 with a 95% confidence interval from 0.66 to 0.95. Their report P less than 0.001 for non-inferiority and P equals 0.01 for superiority. I'll put the results for the other outcomes on the screen just so you can see them. But the bottom line here is that a Pixaban is not only non-inferior, but is actually statistically superior for the primary efficacy outcome with a modest but clinically relevant reduction in stroke and systemic embolism, a substantial reduction in major and intracranial bleeding, and a small reduction in all-cause mortality. Those confidence intervals are also relatively tight, which suggests good precision. And now we come to interpretation and applicability, the so what bit. Here the questions are, are the author's conclusions justified by their data and the study design? Have they acknowledged the main limitations, such as biases, confounders, and generalizability? And I think most importantly, can I apply this to my own patients in my own setting? For applicability, I would compare their population and setting with mine. So are the patients that I see similar in age, comorbidities and disease severity? Are the healthcare systems comparable in terms of resources, monitoring and cost? Really what we're talking about here is external validity. And are there cultural or logistical barriers to using this intervention in other contexts or my context where I might want to apply these findings? So for Aristotle, based on my interpretation, the conclusion that Apixaban was superior to Warfarin is consistent with the data presented in the abstract. In terms of applicability, the trial is most relevant to patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation and at least one stroke risk factor who would otherwise also be candidates for warfarin. I'd be more cautious extrapolating to patients with mechanical valves, severe renal impairment, or very low risk atrial fibrillation, because those groups may have been underrepresented or excluded from the study entirely. And then finally, we come to the bottom line of our critical appraisal. I think we can structure this around three key questions. Validity, which is, are the results likely to be true or not? Importance, are they clinically important? And three, applicability. Would this change what I do? In summary for Aristotle, this is a large, well-conducted, double-blind, randomized trial of high-risk atrial fibrillation patients. Randomization and blinding appear robust. The primary outcome is clinically meaningful. Apixaban is both non-inferior and superior to warfarin for stroke or systemic embolism with substantial reduction in intracranial bleeding and a small reduction in mortality. For patients similar to the trial population in an NHS type setting, this would support choosing a Pixaban over warfarin for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation, assuming no contraindications. And so now guys, you have a template that you can adapt, use, adjust in any ACF or academic interview. The hard part I don't think is memorizing the headings. It logically follows a narrative structure. 
but the hard part is practicing them out loud on as many different abstracts and data sets as you can find. So after this video, pick up a journal, open a random paper, see if you can talk about it for five minutes, 10 minutes using this framework. If you'd like a follow-up, I can do another video where we apply exactly the same formula to a completely different paper, so you can see how it generalizes across specialties and study designs. And I've also made a worksheet that goes along with this video that you can print and use for your own practice or adjust it, do whatever you want, because there is a real lack of resources that are focused on ACF interviews out there, except the paid ones, and you know how I feel about paid resources. <laughs> so thank you very much for watching. Please let me know what you think down below. If you've been invited, for an ACF interview or you're thinking about doing one in the future please let me know if you find it useful or indeed if there's things that I need to improve and other resources that would be helpful. Thank you very much, take care and I'll see you soon.